Hi guys, so as John said, uh, my name is Tanuj. I work for Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Now, Alan gave a presentation on Terraform, which is really great. Uh, now, I was thinking about yesterday that what should I do for the presentation? And I sort of said, why not tell the story of Oxford Nanopore and me, how we came uh, to decisions uh, when we chose our cloud provider, when we chose which tools to use, and how did we build our pipeline and where we are at the moment. So our journey started four or five years ago, that is 2014, where tools like Terraform didn't exist. Uh, the only cloud provider which was stable and had all the stuff which we needed was AWS. Uh, so that's where we started basically. So uh, basic simple considerations, a new company uh, when I started, we had like 50 employees, and now we have 500 employees. So we have grown massively. But when a company starts, what do they do? Uh, when they choose a cloud provider, which tools they use? So I just wanted to go through uh, the process which went into my mind, and everyone else who works within the company. So our consideration was which cloud provider to use. So we said, all right, AWS is a choice. Infrastructure as a code tool, uh, Terraform didn't exist. Uh, it, I think it went in June 2014 or something. Uh, we were looking at AWS, and in the end, we chose CloudFormation. Now, why did we choose CloudFormation? Because, uh, yes, Terraform did come out. It was quite new. We did play around with it, but uh, we, one of my colleagues used to call it Terraform at that time. Uh, it had loads of problems, the state file used to get corrupted, uh, and so on and so forth. So we said, all right, we'll stick with CloudFormation. It's Amazon provided service, nothing will go wrong with it. If it does go wrong, we can just call up Amazon and say, bloody fix this. So simple, easy pick for us at that time. So this I'm talking about late 2014, early 2015. Uh, the next choice we had was which configuration management tool to use. Uh, we looked at Chef, Puppet, so on and so forth, and we said, no, we want something agentless, something much more dynamic, and we chose Ansible. Uh, Packer at that time was uh, one year old, it was quite mature, uh, and we said, okay, if we choose Packer, even if something goes wrong, what can go wrong? I mean, we are just building images, we are not touching anything infrastructure, so that's why we decided to use Packer. We said, okay, Packer is a good tool, instead of writing something uh, on our own, in uh, why Ansible or why AWS CLI and then creating AMI, so on and so forth. So Packer at that time was say, okay, Packer, will you go with Packer? And for automation and orchestrating all of this, we chose Jenkins. Uh, again, GitLab CI didn't exist. Jenkins was tried, tested. We were already using it in the company. So we chose Jenkins. So these are all the uh, questions and steps which we went through uh, when we were selecting our cloud provider, our infrastructure as a code tool, so on and so forth. Now, I know this is infrastructure as a code uh, meetup. I'll do drill into some of the more stuff in CloudFormation in the next slides. So, uh, why CloudFormation? At that time, as I gave you the reason, that was the only tool. Yeah, there were Ansible and other stuff, but we, we thought CloudFormation was the best fit at that time for us. Now, CloudFormation is an AWS tool because this is what uh, they use to manage internally their own infrastructure. So, easy. AWS, support it. AWS supports it, but it has limitations. CloudFormation is not a perfect tool. Uh, CloudFormation has come a long way, uh, but uh, it has loads of limitations, which Terraform is, at the stage it is now, it's really good. But at that time, we didn't have this choice. So we said, okay, CloudFormation. What were the features we were looking for in, uh, in our infrastructure as a tool? The main feature for us was, so we at Oxford Nanopore deploy microservices. So we have small applications with database backends uh, and on and on. So we have 10, 15, 20, 30 of those applications. Some are normal stuff, some are bioinformatic pipelines, so on and so forth. Uh, so the features which we were really looking for in CloudFormation was, Cloud in it, something to provision stuff. Uh, CloudFormation signal, really handy tool if you use CloudFormation. And the creation policy. Now, what is a creation policy? Uh, a creation policy is something, suppose if you have a CloudFormation stack, uh, 
you have three web servers running, uh, you have a database backend, you have a launch configuration, you have an auto scaling policy, which basically scales out your instances and uh, brings them down. Uh, creation policy is an amazing tool in CloudFormation. What it does is basically, if I want to replace something, if I want to uh, basically make changes to my code or iterate over my code, add some new features, creation policy basically says, uh, here you go, I want to update something with new, uh, with this will replace option as true. I'm going to basically do a blue-green deployment. I'm going to launch my new uh, servers, keep the existing one as it is, and once this one passes all the checks, I'm going to take this one down, and then obviously the new ones are already serving traffic. Now, this was the feature we were really looking for, and CloudFormation did provide this. And this is all native by CloudFormation. Uh, the second thing which we were looking for was cloud, cloud init and CFN signal. Now, uh, when you build automated pipelines or when you deploy code, you need to make sure that the code is fine. Your instances have come up, all the health checks have patched, so on and so forth. CFN signal, very handy tool. What it did for us was, whenever this new service came up, uh, we had this health check script, which is still run on all the instances. A health check script is nothing but simple set of scripts, which we write to say, is the database working fine? Is the code working fine? Is the application coming up correctly? So on and so forth. Now, once this health check passed, uh, CFN signal used to signal CloudFormation to say, my instance have passed all the checks. I am good to go. You can now take the old instances down gracefully by draining the connections and adding these ones in. So this helped us build an automated pipeline in 2015 where developers were confident enough to push their code into dev and into staging and into production. Because we knew if they made a mistake, uh, CFN signal would not signal uh, success to CloudFormation and uh, it will just take down the uh, new instances which are just being launched. So these are the features which are really handy in CloudFormation. Uh, other CloudFormation features are simple parameters, auto-scaling groups, launch configuration, RDS, CloudFormation outputs, CloudFormation update stack. Uh, standard AWS uh, services, you can just uh, create parameters. As I said, simple Terraform stuff, but AWS supported. Any new services comes out in AWS, it will have CloudFormation uh, support for it. So you don't have to worry about writing your own modules. You don't have to worry about uh, state. You don't have to worry about, uh, and now with CloudFormation, you, have, you can basically visualize all your resources as well, uh, which is really handy. Now, uh, after we chose CloudFormation, how did we bring everything back home? Uh, which means how did we just uh, stitch everything together? Uh, so what we did was we launched self-contained stack with CloudFormation for each microservice. I know it's not an efficient way, but at that time that was the best way. It was the most stable way we found uh, to put our services out in production. Uh, so we launched self-contained stack for each and every service. We used Packer to build AMIs for uh, each and every application which we had. And obviously, everything was configuration managed by Ansible. So Packer used to invoke Ansible, install all the stuff, build the AMI, and then basically used to push AMI into dev, staging, and production. All the environment variables were in S3, and the instance used to download it during boot to know that this is where I belong to, these are my environment files, so on and so forth. Anything went wrong with uh, when the files were being downloaded or something didn't come up, the CloudFormation signal wouldn't signal CloudFormation and uh, the stack wouldn't be deployed. So it will just keep the existing one and it will uh, not do anything with it. It will just say, sorry, nothing happened. And so CloudFormation update stack, really good uh, feature. If you, take your, if you do update operation on CloudFormation and just replace the AMI with a new one, it does this blue-green deployment automatically for you. Really handy feature. The other thing was a comprehensive health check policy. Uh, a health check script is really good. Everyone should use it uh, if you're not. Uh, just write a bunch of uh, scripts uh, which checks your instances, your applications for each and everything. Uh, once it passes, you know that your application is good to go. Uh, it's going to work. 
So we, use, we chose comprehensive health check scripts uh, to basically signal CloudFormation to say everything is good. Then we used Jenkins to orchestrate basically all of this, uh, which was building a new stack, uh, invoking Packer, pushing updates, uh, creating stuff, so on and so forth. Again, GitLab CI was a distant dream back then. So Jenkins. Now, what were the advantages which uh, we had? AWS instances, uh, AWS supported tools. Everything was AWS supported. Yeah, Ansible and Packer were not, but we knew that we could get support from AWS. Uh, we were using native EC2 instances, so yeah, EC2 instances and VMs are quite stable. Uh, we didn't go with uh, Docker containers. We didn't go with well, Kubernetes, it's a different story. Uh, we did blue-green deployments, uh, simple, keep the existing ones as it is, bring out uh, new servers. If it all passes, just switch them. Uh, automated rollbacks, uh, same via health check scripts. Uh, simple, easy way for us at that time was health check script fails, don't do anything, take the stuff down. Uh, again, yeah, auto scaling. And then we reserved all our instances. Uh, this just to make sure that the cost of each and every micro application was kept uh, to a minimum. Uh, limitations uh, are basically this, each application has to run on an EC2 instance. I mean, it's it's horrible waste of compute and resources. I mean, who does this? But uh, we found uh, four or five years ago that this was the most stable way and uh, best way to deploy our services in production without any uh, unexpected surprises. Uh, we are not Google, we are not Facebook. Uh, we thought, okay, this is what we are gonna do. Uh, a lot of compute is wasted, yes, obviously. Uh, each application has its own EC2 instance. Obviously, we have a lot of waste, uh, wasted compute. Increased cost and a lot of stacks to manage. Yes, we do have a lot of stacks to manage, but uh, we create a micro application once and then all we have to do is just push new code to it. The existing infrastructure stays the same unless we have to increase some database or so on and so forth. Uh, now, quickly I'll go to the future of our pipeline. Uh, what should we do in the future? Now, technology have come a long way since 2015. Uh, there are a lot of new tools. Uh, the first one which we are going to do is move our compute uh, stuff to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is really good uh, and I think everyone should move to it slowly. But once you have your uh, microservices application and stable as our pipeline, it's very difficult to take something which works, which is absolutely fine and move to something else. To start a project from a greenfield, it's really easy. But to take something which has been there for four or five years and then move it to something radically different, uh, it's very tricky and you have to get management uh, to agree with it. They're gonna say, why are you changing it? It fucking works. Uh, it's, sorry, pardon my language. You can take that off. But this, this is what it is. Uh, so, yeah, this is what we are thinking of doing. Move to Kubernetes. Move to Terraform. Terraform is much more stable now than we are than it was uh, back when we were doing stuff. Uh, to make our uh, pipeline cloud agnostic, so that we can easily move to some other provider if we ever want to. Uh, to start with, we are going to use RDS, ELBs, and S3. Uh, we don't want to touch RDS. RDS is very stable, tried, tested. You can recover a snapshot point in time. I don't want to manage MySQL or Postgres instances which we use. It's, it's a terrible idea. Uh, we are going to keep uh, the Packer uh, pipeline as it is because Packer can spit out uh, Docker images, so uh, no problem at all. And the move to GitLab CI. So, GitLab CI is an amazing tool. They have native support for Kubernetes, uh, so you can just deploy your stuff to Kubernetes. Amazing. Uh, how are we going to start with all of these? So I created a GitLab project where you can spin up a Kubernetes cluster uh, using CloudFormation Packer just by click of a button. Now, I'm going to quickly share this with you. Sorry, yeah, so 
the stuff which we have is still being used by our developers. Uh, they, they get nice little messages to say, this is where we are, you're pushing your AMI to prod, and once it's pushed, you get a nice little update complete. So I don't need to be there for them to uh, deploy to production. They can do stuff as they want, move it through dev, staging, and production, all via CloudFormation. Anyways, I'll, I'll share the link with you guys. Uh, basically, it uses, uh, again, Packer to create an AMI with uh, all the Kubernetes stuff. And then, then it uses CloudFormation to basically spin up an auto-scaling group with Kubernetes nodes and an EC2 instance, which is a master server. And as soon as uh, it's all deployed, you can basically connect to the master and deploy, start deploying pods to the uh, nodes. And because it's in an auto-scaling group, uh, you can just scale it up uh, based on compute and a new server will come up. It will automatically join the cluster and you're good to go. Uh, so basically this is, this was our journey or my journey or the company's journey towards uh, going in the cloud and basically choosing tools as we went along and then iterating over it slowly. Uh, I think that's it really. Uh, Thank you. Yep. Yep.